i nie padą w zwykłych pożarach ziemskich, więc nie, nie robią. No tak, ale teraz, teraz to jest kawałek. Zobaczcie, kawałek, to jest kawałek, to jest kawałek, to jest kawałek, to Good evening. Uh, today our speaker is uh, Radek Poleski. Radek uh, uh, obtained PhD here. In this building, in this room, actually, in uh, 2012, um, he was uh, the postdoc and associate researcher in Ohio State University. And in 2020, he back to our observatory and works as an adjunct. He's almost the professor now. Other uh, colors is here. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, disciplinary proceedings against two Warsaw astronomers. Uh, and okay, it's not working. Okay, should we need to Okay, uh, so here is the plan uh, of my talk. I'll start with uh, things that happened before World War II started. That will be a brief introduction, uh, and these are things that were well known. Then I'll talk about what happened during the war. Uh, and these are things that were mostly known. I'll add a few things that I've learned uh, while studying in the archives. Uh, third part is uh, about the disciplinary proceedings themselves, uh, and this is something that was not publicly known uh, for many years. Uh, then I'll present in more detail one of the charges uh, that were in the disciplinary proceedings, and I'll present the aftermath at the end. More? Okay. Uh, so, introduction to a few people that are uh, important in this story. First of all, Professor Michał Kamiński. Uh, he first worked at Pulkov Observatory, uh, then he worked for uh, a number of years for Russian Navy, uh, including Vladivostok. Uh, at some point in 2000, uh, sorry, in 1919, he was asked by Tadeusz Bonachiewicz to come back to Poland. Uh, he first traveled to Japan uh, to work for Japanese Navy there uh, in order to earn enough money for his travel back, back to Poland. Uh, he became the director of the observatory in 1923. Uh, soon afterwards, observatory was 100 years old. And the pictures you see right now are uh, not from the usual day, but they were taken bec uh, because of the 100th anniversary of the observatory. Uh, his work was mostly focused on calculating orbits of comets. Uh, that's what he was mostly known for. And uh, he became the member of the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, and that's quite prestigious. Uh, one minor note, uh, he didn't speak German fluently, uh, though he was uh, studying it. The second person is Dr. Jan Gadomski. Uh, he was first a researcher at uh, Jagiellonian University. Uh, he organized and was director uh, of the small observing station at the Wyszyna Peak. Uh, the conditions there were quite hard for observers, I would say. Uh, later, he obtained a PhD under supervision of uh, Professor Banachiewicz, uh, and uh, he moved to uh, Warsaw in 1927. Uh, and his main one of his uh, tasks was to organize the observing station at the Pip Ivan 
a mountain uh, more than 2,000 meters above the sea level, uh, even harsher conditions than on Wishina Peak, uh, hard to get there, and he, he was involved much in that. The third, per third person is docent Maciej Bielicki. Uh, he started working at the observatory more or less the same time as uh, Gadomski. For the first year, he was just a volunteer. Uh, he studied orbits of comets together with Kamiński, uh, and he was quite an active observer. Uh, one of his achievements was that he published the only paper based on the data from uh, the Ivan Observatory. Uh, the fourth person is Professor Włodzimierz Zon. Uh, I'll probably less talk about him, but I think he's very important to this story. Uh, so he, he was uh, assistant uh, at the uh, university in Vilnius uh, first in 1920s. He got PhD there in 35, uh, and in 38 he moved to Warsaw and he started working as senior assistant. And he was assigned to the Pip Ivan Observatory. And here you have the uh, modern view of the Pip Ivan uh, Observatory, and that's also one of very few. Uh, color images in my presentation. Okay. Uh, so now, what happened with the observatory during the war? First of all, uh, observatory was closed early during the war. Uh, PP1 closed uh, on 17th uh, of September 1939. Uh, Vudimir Zon was moved to an off-lock camp, uh, a camp for officers. Uh, observatory reopened on January 1st, 1940, uh, but at that time it was not part of university anymore. Uh, there was no university, so it couldn't be part of university. And here you have a letter uh, that uh, was directed to the uh, observatory, and at the end it says uh, observatory should be called Warszawa Stenmark uh, since that point. Uh, and observatory worked in very low capacity, I would say. Uh, for example, it was providing time service uh, for the mini institutions or uh, uh, watch repair services also took the time from, from the observatory. Okay. Uh, one thing that I found that found in the archives that is not listed in, in the literature I've read is that there were two uh, Master of Science exams in the underground education at the observatory. Uh, and the name S. Kamelak is, is provided in the documents. And this person had an uh, astronomy exam with uh, Kamiński and math with Professor Wacław Sierpiński, math exam. Uh, so if one wants, you can uh, search the documents uh, of Václav Sierpiński and try to confirm this information. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is um, Hans Frank, uh, the man responsible for the death of millions of people. Uh, he was interested in astronomy, and that's confirmed in a few sources. And he wanted the observatories uh, that were in uh, uh, under German occupation to survive the war, so that after Germans win the war, the German astronomers will be able to use these observatories. That was his idea. Uh, and uh, uh, Gadomski testified that Kem Felician Kempiński read a secret letter about it, and Kempiński told it to Gadomski. Uh, there are no uh, statements uh, of Kempiński himself about that. But that's uh, that what, what the story was stored uh, by Gadomski. So observatory survived till the uh, Warsaw Uprising. Before I go to the uprising, uh, there are two more things I'd like to say. First is about Jerzy Blikle, uh, a friend of Professor Kamiński. Uh, what surprised me was that Kamiński was giving popular science lectures at Blitless Cake Shop. And these popular science lectures were ticketed. So people were paying during the war to listen to popular science uh, talks. Honestly, I was surprised when I read that. Uh, and uh, 
in this group of people who were attending there, they were reading the underground uh, press and uh, Blickler testified that Kaminski was optimistic, which is an important aspect uh, in judging people after the war. Okay, the other person is Professor Kurt Walter. Uh, he got PhD in 28 and did habilitation at the University of Königsberg. Uh, since 1937, he worked at the Humboldt University uh, of Berlin. Uh, he was a lecturer there. Uh, and since 41, he worked also at the Potsdam Observatory. Uh, in March 41, he was offered to become uh, a supervisor of the three observatories that were in the uh, general governorate, uh, Warsaw, Krakow, and Lviv. In his memoir, he wrote that when he traveled, before accepting the position, uh, he traveled to the observatories. And Warsaw astronomers asked him to accept that, uh, that offer because if they do not have a German supervisor, they will not be getting their salaries. And he started the position in April uh, 42. Uh, he was a member of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, yeah. meaning the Nazi party uh, of the German. And during the war, he also uh, was uh, a soldier for al almost a year. And during that time, he was deputized by uh, another astronomer, Robert Henseling. So observatory, oh, sorry, one more thing. Uh, yes, uh, the home army, or in Polish, Arna Krajowa, uh, part of the story. So uh, during the proceedings about which I'll be talking uh, soon, uh, Witold Balzer, a factory owner, testified that he, he has a friend, Tadeusz Szelecki. And Balzer knew Kaminski as a friend. On the other hand, Szelecki knew the head of the Home Army Intelligence Service. Uh, and Gadomski uh, informed the Home Army uh, that Kaminski was serving the Germans. As a result of which, the Intelligence Service decided to send a warning to Kaminski. Uh, a warning from the Home Army Intelligence Service wasn't uh, something pleasant, I would say. Though Szelecki, uh, through Szelecki, uh, Balzer communicated that Kaminski had just some quirks in his behavior. Here you have uh, original language, in, uh, original text in Polish. And finally, no, uh, no warning uh, was sent by the Home Army. Okay, we're coming to the Warsaw Uprising. Uh, so on August 2nd, uh, meaning the second day of the uprising, the tanks uh, shelled the observatory, uh, the building was searched, uh, nothing was found, and uh, a bit more than a week later, the building was burned. Uh, here you have an image from the reconstruction. If you see it in the front row, you see men working here on the reconstruction in 1948. Uh, not much survived from the observatory, so all the personal letters uh, are gone, all the personal documents are missing. Uh, one thing that I found was that in 2006, the daughter and granddaughter of uh, Gadomski wrote an article uh, which said that in the observatory, plenty of weapons for insurgents were hidden. And that's the only place that states that. If, if someone can confirm or deny it, it would be nice. And here's copy paste, it's part of the article. If you read in Polish, uh, you will see that the daughter and granddaughter don't remember very well because they write that it was on the day uh, of the start of the uprising. Uh, the Germans uh, searched the building, actually, it was on the second day. Still, that's quite a new information, I would say, about uh, weapons for insurgents hidden, hidden in this building. Okay, the disciplinary proceedings. They start by a letter written by Kaminski in February 45. Uh, so the, somebody uh, was spreading bad news about Kaminski uh, in Krakow and Warsaw. 
for and it was about Kaminsky's actions between 1940 and 1944. Uh, and Kaminsky wanted them to be displayed completely, uh, his actions to be displayed completely. Hence, he asked himself for a disciplinary investigation to be launched. Uh, Rector Stefan Tinikowski uh, agreed to open this investigation uh, on the August 1st, 1945. First, it was a preliminary investigation. Uh, a month later, there is a meeting uh, of the University Senate, and that was the first meeting after the war. Uh, on the fourth, the agenda is prepared, and the agenda has a point for the case of Professor Michał Kamiński, and it has a handwritten note, Nawroczyński. Nawroczyński was a vice rector at that time, and there is nothing more uh, there. Uh, the meeting took place three days later, and the uh, Senate decided uh, on opening disciplinary proceedings against Kamiński. And it also has point 4a, uh, in which uh, the name of Maciej Bielicki uh, appears for the first time. And there's an investigation launch also against Bielicki. Uh, the next month, the Ministry of Education uh, is already aware of the case. And the Senate suggests to not lower uh, Kaminski's salary uh, because of his health. And this was the only such case at the University of Warsaw Senate meetings in 1945. Uh, in next years, there were more such cases. I don't know the numbers at this point. So I mentioned Bielicki for the first time about the disciplinary proceedings, and I have only one slide uh, about those. Uh, so Bielicki himself also asked for the disciplinary proceedings. Uh, and it was based on the news uh, spread by uh, the gossips spread by Gadomsky. He clearly says that Gadomsky was uh, spreading these gossips. Uh, Bielicki was found innocent of all the uh, charges, though uh, Gadomsky continued to, to spread the gossips. Some of them included accusations related to the uh, uh, August 1944 decree. Uh, this decree is in Polish called Cierpniówka. Uh, you have the title of the act uh, here. Uh, these were very strong. In general, the, this decree is, is very strong. I would say that in order to accuse somebody of such actions, you would uh, need to have solid evidence. Uh, the case was presented to the prosecutor uh, in 1949, and the prosecutor didn't want to open an investigation against Bielicki because first, uh, there were no evidence against Bielicki. Second, the accusations were not fully formulated or completely formulated. Uh, and the building shown here is the current view of the building in Krakow, uh, where University of Warsaw Observatory was to be revived in 1944. In 44, they really started, they got there in 1944. Uh, so uh, actually, Kaminski stayed there till 1963. So uh, since disciplinary action started against uh, Kaminski he couldn't be uh, the director of the observatory anymore. And uh, in September, uh, the director Pinkowski decided that he suspends uh, Kaminski from being director. Uh, the, the duties are passed to Gadomski, but Gadomski does not have the habilitation degree, which is, which is required in order to be the observatory director. So then uh, a supervisor is appointed. This supervisor was mathematician Kazimierz Kuratowski. Uh, soon afterwards, mathematicians were also working in this building. Uh, Kuratowski was involved in uh, actually rebuilding. And here you have the letter uh, to Kaminski uh, stating that uh, Kuratowski will be the, uh, 
the supervisor. So all the important documents were most probably signed by Kuratowski, but on daily basis, Gadomski was really in charge of the observatory. Uh, these first proceedings took place at the university level. And the legal basis for them was the decree of the president from 1928, so much before the war, the decree on service relationship of professors of national academic schools and some other uh, people. Okay, it was, uh, I would say it was like an honorary act. Uh, so it said, for example- Radek, could you repeat the question because it doesn't come over on Zoom. I didn't ask a question. So no, some... you, there was a question in the audience and you need to repeat it. No, that was not a question. That was just an uh, unmuted person. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so th this act uh, said that the professor is obliged to serve the Republic of Poland faithfully, for example. Uh, and the penalties were for an activity that does not correspond to the dignity of a professor of a state academic school. Uh, also, the defendant has the right to appoint a defense counsel from among the professors of the state academic school. So no normal lawyer could not, be, could not defend uh, one in such proceedings. Uh, one thing uh, that I also found that there is no language similar to uh, proven beyond reasonable doubt, the language that we typically would find in, uh, uh, in criminal cases or criminal laws. So this decree uh, was based for these, these proceedings. Uh, charges, there were six charges. Uh, first, first charge against Kamiński was that he removed and thrown out on the terrace, the Polish plaque observatorium, uh, the plaque that was in front of the building, and that he ordered the custodian to destroy the Polish flag. On his, second, on his initiative, he introduced the German language to scientific notes. Third, that he answered phone uh, by saying, Herr Sternwarte Warschau Direktor. Fourth, that he greeted Germans by rising hand in a Hitlerian way. Fifth, uh, has not limited himself to handing the German work ideas to the personnel, but additionally preached to them that they must uh, loyally fulfill their duties and serve the German right. And here, although the documents are in general um, in formal language, here it's it's not, and I noted, w duchu obywatelskiego i narodowego zapszaństwa. Uh, and the final uh, charge was that he informed on paper the German authorities that Rachel Azon, uh, who was of Jewish descent, resides at the observatory, which threatened unavoidably her to be taken to the ghetto. That was the charge, the, the last charge against uh, Kamiński. Uh, the committee that the disciplinary committee that was deciding if, if he was guilty or not and was uh, conducting the whole investigation was composed of professors uh, Włodzimierz Kozubski, the chair here on the left. Uh, he was a lawyer, uh, first working at the Jagiellonian University, then here at Warsaw University. Professor Wacław Borowy, uh, who was a Polish literature scholar and the director of the observator uh, of the library of the university uh, and professor Witold Doroszewski, uh, Lexi Groch, uh, Lexi Gochrafer and linguist also connected to the university for a long time. Uh, I would like to note that uh, these three men and uh, further professors that I'll be presenting, most of them were involved uh, in uh, underground education or some underground work or ser ser uh, saving the uh, library during the war. Uh, I think only one of them uh, really spent the war in, in a camp similar to Zong. But they were, they were aware of what happened during the war and what were the conditions. Uh, the disciplinary ombudsman uh, was Professor Franciszek Czubalski, a physiologist, 
uh, for a long time also connected to the university and he was director of the university soon afterwards. Uh, and the defense uh, attorney uh, uh, selected by Kamiński was a lawyer, uh, Professor Stanisław Śliwiński, uh, also connected to the university. Here's a list of witnesses. Uh, we have Jerzy Blikle, about whom I already spoke, Jerzy Grudkowski, the custodian of the observatory, Maciej Bielicki, Jan Gadomski, who was interviewed twice, Bogdan Pniewski, uh, Antoni Buczyński, this, these two were friends of uh, Kamiński, uh, Roman Hobenza from the Botanical Garden. Uh, for those who are not right now in the building but are uh, over the internet, the Botanical Garden surrounds the observatory. Uh, Rachela Zon, wife of Professor Włodzimierz Zon and at the time the observatory secretary. Uh, Michał Waszkowski, uh, who was uh, a uh, distant relative of Kamieński, uh, Witold Bal Balzer, whom I already mentioned, Robert uh, Walter, an engineer, uh, Kamieński himself, himself, and Cezary Kunderowicz, the clerk of the university before, during, and after the war. Uh, and here's the verdict. Uh, the verdict was that Kamieński is guilty of uh, four out of the six charges. He was found innocent on uh, second, on uh, introducing the German language to scientific notes on his own initiative and answering the phone in German. The penalty, uh, out of the six penalties that could be selected uh, according to this 1928 uh, law, uh, the fifth harshest was chosen, which is immediate retirement, and the pension lower uh, by one quarter. And it could be lower by half at maximum. And from the sentencing, uh, I uh, selected some, some texts. Uh, due to serious misconduct, he should not remain in the university community. That was the, the verdict. Uh, and here's a longer part on uh, how the penalty was decided. Uh, so different aspects were taken into account. At the end, it says uh, defendant's special type of mentality and uh, uh, physical attitude. Um, in Polish, tudzież szczególny rodzaj umysłowości umienionego, jego psychiczne nastawienia. Um, this part was related to the last accusation, uh, the accus accusation about revealing to Germans uh, that Rachel Azon was leaving the observatory. Kamiński appealed. Uh, he appealed, and there is a long text, 15 pages, uh, written by a lawyer, most probably Śliwiński, though it's signed by Kamiński. And out of these 15 pages, I selected just four, sorry, five arguments. Uh, first argument was um, rather clerical, that there was a lack of properly formulated charges that the charges were in the wrong document and, and stuff like that. The second argument was about uh, Professor Felician Kempinski, uh, who failed to appear to testify, uh, though he sent a letter. And this letter was very similar to what Gadomski testified first. Second, this letter was read as, as if it was a deposition, so as if uh, Kempinski was testifying. In fact, Kempinski did not appear, and only uh, you know testimony is given by a person, living person, uh, that could be asked, uh, should be taken into account. Third, that Kempinski was hostile against Kamiński. And fourth, that uh, Kempinski claimed that Gadomski should be the observatory director. So this is what was in Kamiński's appeal. Uh, Kamiński also, in this appeal, wrote, sorry, it was written there that Gadomski was uh, clearly biased against uh, the defendant. Uh, and what's surprising, was not properly sworn in. And this swore, not properly sworn in, I would say this is quite an important aspect of that. Uh, and also uh, some texts related to uh, this honorary part, I would say that uh, the defendant wasn't preoccupied with principles of Hitlerism, 
so incompatible with his mystical religious beliefs. And you have text in Polish, uh, if, if you want to read. Finally, uh, the, the last argument that I took from these 15 pages was that the rising of a hand while greeting was not in a Hitlerian way. And Kaminski had such a habit before the war. That was what was written there, and uh, some of the witnesses confirmed uh, this habit uh, before the war. Uh, based on this, uh, there was a second proceeding. This time, the proceedings were conducted at the um, level of the ministry. There were only minor ch uh, changes in charges. The list of wi witnesses uh, was shorter. So Tadeusz Bonakiewicz, who testified in Krakow, uh, Wacław Sierpiński, the mathematician, and the four astronomers, uh, Zeidler, Kempiński, Gadomski, and Quebec. So finally, Kempiński testified in this, in this second proceedings. Uh, the committee that was uh, deciding was composed of Jan Wasilkowski, uh, who was the chair of the committee, who was professor of law, uh, and he was also a director of the university soon afterwards. Uh, Bolesław Kryniewiecki, uh, professor of botany, uh, he was director of the botanical garden for many years, and he was director of the university before the war. Uh, and Stanisław Turczynowicz, the only one who was not at uh, University of Warsaw, but at the Warsaw University of Life Sciences, uh, he was professor of land improvement. <laughs> Uh, so this was the deciding committee. Uh, the disciplinary ombudsman at this point was uh, Professor Viktor Grzywo Dombrowski, the professor of legal medicine, uh, also for a long time uh, at the University of Warsaw. And the defense attorney was uh, Jakub Savicki, uh, who was the professor of law uh, here at the University. Uh, the verdict. Uh, had one change. Uh, so Kaminski was found innocent on the first uh, charge, meaning the removing and throwing the uh, Polish flag and ordering the custodian to destroy the Polish flag. So still Kaminski was found guilty on the remaining three charges. So greeting Germans by raising the hand uh, and preaching that uh, employees should loyally fulfill their duties. Uh, and informing on paper uh, about uh, the place of stay of Rachel uh, Out of these six possible penalties, the four harshest was chosen. So immediate retirement, uh, the, uh, the pension stays at the normal level. Uh, at that point, Kaminski was 69 years old. Uh, at 70, he would have to stop be, be the director of the observatory and stop work at the university. So it was soon, soon before that. Uh, and some citation from the text. Uh, an aggravating circumstance was the fact that the defendant maintained relationships with Professor Kopf of Berlin uh, during the German occupation. Uh, and these uh, relationships resulted in a scientific paper published uh, in a German journal. Uh, Kaminski testified that actually this paper was published simultaneously in Berlin, Copenhagen, and Harvard. When I tried to find that paper, I found a paper published during the war uh, at Yale, not Harvard, but uh, it's, it's, it's maybe the, the same one. Uh, so not publishing papers together with uh, in German language or in German journals was, uh, was rather a rule for Polish scientists during the war. Personal aspect of the case, um, Ludwig Zeidler testified that he was at the meeting of Professor Kempiński, who was working at the uh, University of Technology then, and two assistants of him. And they discussed the trial uh, and uh, or the proceeding, and someone declared that the issue of rightness of, or wrongness of the charges was indifferent. The main thing was that this was the only opportunity to get rid of uh, Professor uh, Kaminski and vacate the chair. That, was, that is what uh, Zeidler testified. Similarly, Vashkowski, the uh, 
distant relative of Kamiński, uh, who didn't know uh, astronomers very well. Uh, he testified that uh, from Kamiński, he knew that the Gadomski was the one who was accusing. And one more person, Professor Eugeniusz Rybka, uh, he was writing a chronicle for many years. And in June 45, also he was an employee here at the observatory in 1920s. Uh, he wrote that there were disciplinary proceedings against Kamiński, parenthesis, Gadomski's action, <clears throat> allegedly on charges of submissions to the Germans. OK, so uh, the new part in this section about disciplinary proceedings comes from the mainly from the file that is uh, at the Polish archives. It's more than 200 pages. So uh, I do not have time to discuss all the charges and all, all the details. So here's the list of uh, the charges with the verdict from the second proceedings. And I would like to present one of those, those charges. Which one you would like to hear in detail, in more detail than the last one? Zan, yeah. OK, uh, you're lucky because that's the one I've selected as well. So I'm prepared to present that one. OK. Uh, so Rachela Zon was wife of uh, Professor Wozimierz Zon. They, together with their daughter, uh, Lydia, live at the observatory before the war. Uh, in December 39, uh, Zon, as a reserve officer, uh, who actually uh, was mobilized in August 1939, uh, Zon had to go to an off -like camp. Uh, and before he did so, he had a conversation with Kamiński. And the main part about that was coal supplies for Rachel Zon and, and Lydia Zon. So at the time, the, the coal was an important aspect and, and really being able to heat up the, the room uh, was a struggle. Uh, so definitely this conversation happened, uh, although to my surprise, Zon never was asked about that in, in these proceedings. Uh, he didn't testify. Uh, Rachel Zon wasn't receiving enough call from Kamiński, definitely. That's confirmed in, in different sources, uh, especially during the first winter uh, of the war. And soon their contacts got very tense. Very tense meaning that they both lived in the same building and they were exchanging messages on paper via the custodian. They didn't talk to each other. So the question if Kaminski should provide more call to Rachela is not an easy one. Uh, it wasn't the call Probably it wasn't the call that Kaminski could decide on uh, on his own. I can tell more if, if there are questions about that. So Rachel Azon was of a Jewish descent, but she was considered a half Jew, uh, according to the German law at that time. And she herself testified that he was a, a half Jew. And in Polish, uh, she, word, uh, she used the word Mishaniec. Hence, she should not be moved to the ghetto as a help to. And additionally, she had a Kenkarte, uh, the ID that was, uh, that was given to people living in Poland during the war, and the Kenkarte was indicating she was Polish. Uh, at some point, Germans introduced a decree that was for uh, the Belvedere Palace, the Wazienki Park, uh, the Observatory, the Botanical Garden, that all the people living in this area should be employed. And Rachel Azon was not. She didn't have an employment. Kaminski asked various people what he should do in that case. Uh, so he asked the Roman Kubenza from the Botanical Garden. Uh, he asked uh, Michał Waszkowski. And he asked the third person, definitely, maybe more, the third person was Zygmunt Zagorowski. Uh, 
So early during the war, uh, the Polish Ministry of Education was replaced by so-called Liquidation Commission. And here you have the German name if you, if you want to read. Uh, and Zagorowski was the counter, Polish counterpart of the head of this ministry, uh, and the head was Werner Schaschel. I hope I pronounced it properly. Uh, Zagorowski was working in the ministry before the war and also was uh, in this liquidation commission. So Kamiński informed Zagorowski about this, the stay of Rachel Azon here in, at the observatory. Uh, Zagorowski met with Rachel Azon and told her she had to move out. Then Rachela contacted her friend uh, and asked the friend for help in finding a new apartment. That friend, according to Rachel Azon, contacted mm -hmm. uh, Felician Kempiński about the situation. Kempiński, together with Gadomski, talked to Zagorowski and somehow convinced him that Rachel Azon should stay. Zagorowski presented the case to Chashel in such a way that Chashel agreed that Rachel Azon can stay at the observatory. And the fact that Kempiński with Gadomski both went to Zagorowski and somehow convinced him is confirmed by uh, different, uh, by a number of uh, witnesses that testified. Uh, at some point, Bielicki and his wife, Ludosława Leoniak, visited Rachel Azon to view the apartment. It was a three-room apartment. Uh, so quite a lot, I would say, probably for a, a woman with a child during the war. Uh, so she proposed that they take two of the three rooms that she, she was occupying. And they have even chosen their rooms, although they never moved in. And that was testified by Rachela Zon. Finally, Rachela Zon was informed she had to move out. Uh, and in December 42, she moved out to the Institute of Experimental Physics, Hoja Street 69. Uh, this, the fact that this happened was actually accepted by Zagorowski. And Professor Stepan Pienkowski and his wife, Maria, were supporting uh, Rachel and Lidia. Um, Rachel Azon survived the whole war and died uh, in 1948. And here's some... Uh, parts from the Kaminski's defense uh, on different days. Uh, this is his general defense that the entire conduct, everything what he was doing was aimed at saving the observatory for future Poland uh, and the employees from being thrown out of the street. Uh, and he repeated it on various days uh, uh, by testifying and also in letters. Uh, he said that, that he was not an anti-Semite and he never was one. Uh, when it pa comes to passing information to Zagorowski, uh, he said that maybe uh, on uh, Zagorowski's request, Kamiński wrote on a piece of paper the name and the address of the person uh, so that uh, Rachel Azan could be contacted. Uh, but there was no, like, you know, official letter, anything like that. And also Kamiński claimed that he contacted Zag Zagorowski privately. Uh, finally, from the this appeal, uh, after the first proceedings, a uh, very general statement about the law. Uh, so uh, this should be considered a negligent fault. And... If there is a negligent fault, but the harmful effect does not occur, then there should be no accountability. This is one of this was one of the uh, lines of defense of Kamiński. Uh, after Rachel Azon moves out, the technician Trifon Karpovich and his wife Maria moved into this uh, three-room apartment. And previously, they were living in one room apartment here in the building. Uh, the custodian, Józef Grudkowski, uh, claimed that Karpowicz asked Hult Walter, the, the supervisor of the observatories, 
for the apartment of Rachela Zon, which resulted uh, in removal of, of Rachela. That's only testified by Grudkowski, nobody else testified about that. Uh, and in February 1945, Kaminski apologized to Rachela Zon in the presence of Gadomski. At that time, Rachela Zon was uh, a secretary of the observatory working in Krakow. And she died in 1948 after the war. Uh, Lydia Zon Karabasz, uh, the child of Włodzimierz and Rachela Zon, uh, became a film editor, she became a professor. Uh, she was born in 1939, so she was five years old when the war started. Uh, she has some memories about the war, uh, and she knew some, that somehow Kaminski was considered dubious. Uh, she didn't know about the disciplinary proceedings uh, when I talked to her. So here's a photo of her from years ago, and here's modern photo. Uh, she didn't know, for example, that her, her mother traveled from Krakow to Warsaw to testify. Uh, and there are, uh, there are uh, there are confirmations uh, of that at the archives. Um, finally, the aftermath of the um, of the uh, proceedings. Uh, in some of the official documents, Kaminski is not titled professor anymore after the case, but a master of science. So here's a letter from 48, which says Master of Science Michał Kamiński. And here's the first page of the personal file at the Ministry of Higher Education and Science. So it has one font that says Kamiński Michał, and the other font, font and a different uh, color of a pen saying Master of Science, uh, full professor till uh, February 29th, uh, 1948, uh, disciplinary proceedings. Uh, Gadomski does not become an observatory director, so he was this acting director. He didn't have the habilitation which one must have in order to be director. He applied for habilitation uh, in 1946. Uh, the main paper was uh, Definitive Total Light Curve of Comet Whipple Fetke, and the title is quite long, so I didn't copy paste the whole one, and it was published in 1947. Professor Sierpiński, the mathematician testified in 47 uh, that Kempinski proposed Gadomski to be the University of Warsaw Astronomy uh, Chair. Also that according to the common opinion, Gadomski does not have proper competence to be the director. And finally, he said that at the, the uh, department board meeting, uh, he meaning the uh, uh, Sierpiński pointed out that the fact that Gadomski made an accusation and then applied for the habilitation could seem as drawing the benefit uh, by Gadomski from the accusation he made. And if you can read, here's uh, the text from the uh, from the, this testimony. So the. the the university observatory does not have the direct, formal director. In 48, uh, it's proposed that Wilhelmina Ivanovska uh, from the Nikolaus Copernicus University in Torun, that she takes the, uh, the position of the uh, director. Mm -hmm. uh, it was quite hard to contact her then, but in her reply, she asked for three things. First, funds for 1.5 to 2 meter telescope. Actually, such a telescope we did not have till today. No, maybe ESO is, is a different part, but really she asked for that. Uh, that was first thing. Second was laying off the adjunct, uh, Janusz Pagaczewski. And he asked for a three-room apartment for her and her family. And actually, university agreed. The department board accepted her request uh, in '49. Somehow the telescope did not happen, uh, and it was on the university's side that they really didn't act upon that. Why exactly it didn't happen? That's probably a different story. And in 49, uh, Zon obtained habilitation at the Nikolaus Copernicus University, and the next year he became the director of the observatory, the position which he had for many years. 
Uh, Professor Kamiński, uh, in 59 and 60, was a half-time professor at the uh, Institute of Astronomy, Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, I tried to find documents uh, about hiring him in this position. I think it would be very important to find those. But it's in, they're not in the uh, Polish Academy of Sciences archives, so probably they did not survive. Uh, in 64, uh, there was a celebration of his 60 years of scientific career. Uh, there was a speech given by Professor Józef Witkowski. Of course, that speech had nothing about, uh, the, uh, about the disciplinary proceedings. Uh, one more celebration was uh, 90th uh, birthday of Kamiński which was organized by Vladimir Zon here at the observatory. And there were speeches given by Zon, Bielicki, and, and Rybka, uh, and that's from Rybka's Chronicle. Uh, Kamiński died in 1973. Uh, there were three obituaries published uh, soon after his death. First by Ludwig Zeidler, did not mention uh, the disciplinary proceedings in any way. Second was by Bielicki, in Postępy Astronomy, uh, and he wrote that in 48, Kamiński was pensioned off by the university. Nothing more about that, but this one sentence uh, was published then in 73. Uh, Józef Witkowski in Quarter Journal of Royal Astronomical Society wrote an article in 74. Also, there was nothing uh, about the case. Uh, years later, when Urania and Postępy Astronomy combined into one magazine, Urania Postępy Astronomy, in 2007, uh, Krzysztof Ziołkowski wrote an article about Kamieński uh, and mentions suspension from director duties. And he, he writes that, uh, which was probably a consequence of opening disciplinary proceedings by the disciplinary committee. So he only writes about opening the, the proceedings. Uh, the text suggests it was either a mis misunderstanding or a primitive intrigue. And these are the exact words from the, the article. Uh, and this text also says that uh, the actions of Banachiewicz in Krakow and Professor Rybka in Lviv, these actions were met with appreciation and gratitude in, in contrast to what was, uh, what happened to Kamieński. Uh, their actions during the war. Um, as far as I know, there's nothing more published about this case in, in any, any source that I'm aware. Uh, Professor Kul Walter, he, he left Krakow in 1944. Uh, he was later uh, a librarian in Stuttgart, so didn't work as an astronomer for almost 20 years. Uh, then he went back to astronomy at the University of Tübingen. He observed many times at ESO Lassi Observatory, even after his retirement uh, in 72. He has not faced any disciplinary uh, charges uh, and he died in 1992. In summary, uh, there were disciplinary proceedings. Uh, they were initiated because of the rumors that were spread by Gadomski, uh, who wanted to become a director of the observatory. Kamiński was found guilty of the three charges and was sentenced by the disciplinary commission. And while uh, working on that uh, and analyzing these uh, archive documents, I revealed some things that were probably not known or at least not known to me. And these uh, two master of science exams in underground, uh, underground education and ticket lectures at the Blickless uh, cake shop uh, were examples of that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Radek. Uh, time for questions. Yes, please. So, please repeat the question. Okay. Uh, what were the charges against Bielicki? Uh, so they're not mentioned directly in the text. So the um, Institute of National Memories uh, has the file uh, from the prosecutor, which has a letter written by uh, Bielicki 
about this about the whole thing. And actually, Bielicki wanted to uh, accuse Gadomski of like blackmailing because Gadomski was repeating the charges even though uh, Bielicki was found innocent. So these documents only give uh, this um, act from uh, August 44 as a base, potential base of, for the proceedings, for the uh, prosecutor's proceedings. Uh, you may look what's what's in that uh, uh, in general in that uh, act. Uh, you know, it was for war criminals. Uh, you know, very bad people were sentenced based on that act. Uh, in its early version, uh, the only possible penalty for some of the articles was death penalty. So it was really harsh uh, accusation, I would say. But exactly what it was, I don't know. Our question. I have a question. Please go ahead, to Andy. Well, my question is fairly broad and may reflect misunderstandings of the situation of Poland during the war. But my impression was overall that the German occupation was quite harsh and several million people were killed. And I, this is my general impression that the Gestapo was running amok. And yet, it seems like the observatory was functioning somehow quasi-autonomously and people were expected to show defiance of uh, German occupation. Just seems very incongruous to me. Maybe I haven't understood your presentation correctly or maybe my understanding of the situation in Poland is incorrect. Maybe this is too broad a question for your research, but it's very striking to me. So uh, between 19, uh, January 1940 and uh, April or so 1942, when Kurt Walter was, uh, became this supervisor of the three observatories, uh, there were only three people hired uh, at the observatory. So it was uh, Kamiński, Gadomski, and the custodian Grudkowski. So, so two astronomers uh, and the custodian. Uh, when you read those, when I read those documents, including uh, memories of, of Gadomski, for example, he claims that the amount of food they had was like 10% of, of the one that they normally ate before the war. Uh, so the, these conditions, you know, were definitely very harsh. Uh, so, you know, uh, the whole university, uh, did not exist. Yeah, Germans said that you know uh, it's closed. Uh, there was there was an underground uh, education, uh, but you know observatory not being part of the university because it was you know uh, that's may 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 be a bias. So if if you uh, look at this case as an astronomer being uh, being in such a position uh, and the number of astronomers in general being low at the university, uh, it was because, uh, you know, the observatory had to exist. Germans said that, you know, you're reopening, you have to do some observations, you have to provide time. So, uh, you know, it the definitely observatory existed. Uh, they were providing the time. Uh, since 42, uh, they had more money to run the observatory. Uh, you know, definitely it wasn't enough. Uh, uh, they almost lost their library. Uh, they, they lost uh, important instruments. Important for them, it was like the only instruments they had uh, for observing. So I know I moved on that part uh, fast because I wanted to dis describe the disciplinary proceedings. So the the whole uh, history of the observatory during the war is uh, maybe a separate topic. Yeah, sorry, can I have a short follow-up on this? Because yeah. it, 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 it is very interesting about the difficult conditions at the observatory, but my real question is that People were expected to act 
in this observatory is sort of semi in a semi resistance mode or something, which just seems incredible to me that the Germans would be occupying this observatory wouldn't have spies or I, I don't know what I don't know how you do an occupation, but that they wouldn't do more to keep control of uh, uh, you know, the observatory personnel, maybe it was not as important as underground armies or something, but it seems pretty important because they're trying to preserve this observatory, you know, as a functioning unit, which they want to be a Nazi um, organization eventually. And I guess they're stuck with Polish astronomers or something. But anyway, it seems strange to me that not not that the economic conditions or the observ observing conditions were not harsher, but that the political conditions were not harsher. So... Uh... More context to that, uh, Kurt Walter was visiting Warsaw more or less once per month. Uh, he was once at the Pip Ivan Observatory, which then was not actually working, yes. So uh, maybe something that I should have said, uh, the, the Pip Ivan Observatory, the observatory at the Pip Ivan was just an addition, the main part of that, which was like the border, uh, control point, or uh, sorry, the, uh, the the place where the soldiers stationed uh, and the meteorological observatory. So astronomical part was not really there. Um, one of the uh, senior colleagues told me that uh, Walter was, uh, when he was coming here, uh, he was moving through the building with, with a gun. So that's something that you, you don't expect normally uh, you know, uh, by a scientist to walk everywhere with a gun. Um, maybe if I have more memories from this, uh, from what I read, I will email to you, Andy, uh, about details of this political situation. Okay, thank you. I do have more questions. Okay, uh, I have a, a short comment, uh, Slavic here. Uh, Slavik Ruciński in Toronto. Uh, it just happened that I, I met Kurt uh, Walter. I don't remember. I think it happened in at ESO. And he positioned himself as a defender of Polish astronomy, that he strongly uh, su suggested that uh, only thanks to him that the uh, astronomy survived in Poland. So uh, a, a few uh, of, of the senior colleagues said that, that to me that they, they met uh, or wrote uh, in their articles that they met Kurt Walter. Uh, for one aspect against him, uh, for example, was this uh, the moving of the observatory library during the war. So uh, apparently he agreed on that, uh, and that then somehow Gadomski was able to move back the. I don't remember, like 15,000 books back to the observatory. Of course, later that all of them burned, so maybe it doesn't matter that much. Uh, you know, there were definitely very valuable books. So there were like uh, from uh, 16th century or so, uh, the oldest ones. Uh, and apparently Walter ag uh, agreed on, on that. So may I take one more minute? Oh, of course. Uh, I made a list of possible topics of discussion. I know I'm much over time. So if you want to discuss any one of those uh, with me later on, I'm open for the discussions. OK, so I don't see more questions. So I think we have to thanks again, Radek. And next week, we will have the talk of Marcin Gabrański from uh, Toruń about the past uh, radio burst. Um, see